Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with SAG AFTRA Foundation and thank you so much for tuning into another one of our conversations at home. I want to continue reminding everyone watching that the SAG AFTRA Foundation is a nonprofit which is currently running a COVID-19 emergency assistance fund which is working to support SAG AFTRA members who are out of work due to all the closed film and television productions. So please check out the link below this video and consider supporting to us if you're able to in any way. Today we're incredibly fortunate to be joined by Mayor Sorvino. Um, I wanted to just start by asking you kind of how your day today has been and you've, I see you've got a tiny new addition in the form of a kitten with you. Yes, this is Cloudy. He is a foster kitten. Um, his mom uh, is a semi-feral cat and they were found abandoned in a gas station um, dumpster. And there are three kittens, and they're amazing, and they've been getting bigger and healthier every day. We've had them for a couple of weeks, and they're amazing. So this is Cloudy. <laughs> um, my four kids make my day busy and rich, and, uh, and uh, yes, uh, very excited that Hollywood is coming out today. So that's been sort of exciting and just trying to, you know, post things online while I'm running around making four different breakfasts because everybody likes something different. Well, since you mentioned Hollywood, I wanted to jump into asking you a little bit about working on that project. And one of the things I was really interested in is the fact that, you know, not all the scripts were there for you and the rest of the cast from the get-go. So I was curious about how much you knew about your character at the beginning and, and how you worked to develop her, given that you didn't have all the details and the specifics up front. Yeah, I, I didn't actually... All I knew was that there was a Lana Turner type character um, in this fabulous new Ryan Murphy project centering on the golden age of Hollywood. And uh, I was like, let me know, where can I sign up? This sounds amazing. And um, originally they said she was sort of a cross between Lana Turner and Joan Crawford. But I think as we got into the story, she was sort of neither in a way, but if she was closer to either of them, it would have been Lana because she didn't really have any of that hard archness of Joan. Um, she was more empathetic, I think, uh, and a little bit ridiculous, um, which was really fun to play. But I didn't, uh, I didn't have any of the scripts when I said yes. And then, um, and then my very first day, they, I think, you know, right before that, they sent me the script for that episode or the pages that were available for that episode. That, and not the whole thing had been approved or finalized or whatever. And um, it was filming a scene within a scene. You know, we're filming an old Hollywood film called Mr. Cooper's Widow. And, you know, it's like one of those, one of those stories where somebody disappears for a few years and is presumed dead and life changes and then they appear alive, you know. Um, but, uh, and I'm working with uh, Laura Harrier's character, Camille, and she is, you know, a young, a young aspiring actress who is so talented that all they're giving her is maid roles. And the director wants her to do the maid role more caricature, caricature-ishly, yes. Uh, <laughs> and I empathize with her. And after we finished the scene, you see me briefly stopping and kind of giving her a pat on the back and being like, I know how hard it is, basically. Um, and, uh, and so that's my first scene and that was the first day and it was crazy because it did feel like I was stepping back onto an old movie sound set because they had all of the period elements. They had a, a period cameras and period lights and all these period hair and makeup people, you know, dressed up with their little aprons and their tools and, and everything felt like I was in the past. It was, it was kind of crazy. And I'd been watching all of these Lana Turner movies and you know, I have this, this speech, which I give to like a board of directors, you know, I don't care whether you think, well, you know, what, what you think my husband wanted, I know what he, you know, just, <laughs> just, just, and it was, it was really, it was really fun. I was so happy um, because I felt the world had been replicated so authentically and I was free to play in it. Yeah, no, it's, it's an amazing performance and it really stands out throughout the whole series. Because you were talking about the moment where you're filming a film within the television series, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that specifically, because it's a very unique thing to be giving that type of performance. And especially, you know, movies had a different acting, people spoke in a different intonation, and, and how you really thought about the type of performance that would be in the research that came in really handy for nailing those spells. Yeah, um, I, I really did study Lana Turner quite a lot, and I tried to emulate her style of speech and her mid-Atlantic, you know, you know, the, the funny thing is you actually see a scene in which Helen Taylor is teaching the crop of young hopeful studio actresses how to speak with mid-Atlantic accent and she, you know, basically explains that 
no one lives in the mid Atlantic. It's just a, you know, it's just a created accent that, and I've even asked my father, you know, in the past, did people speak like that? And he said, no, <laughs> no one actually spoke like that, but the old movies people did. And um, I do feel like some heads of state, some, you know, there is a certain section of the East Coast elite that did have a little bit more of that Britishism in their, in their patois. But uh, yeah, so I, I, I watched a ton of Lana Turner movies and uh, documentaries. I read all these books about her and I came to feel that my character was somewhat different than her and that Lana was a real mover and shaker and ultimate Hollywood survivor. And I felt like my character is not. She doesn't have those, she doesn't have that iron will to succeed. She's, she's hopeful and she's steadfast, but she's not so ambitious that she makes it all happen no matter what, you know? And I felt like Lana was very adept at riding the crests of varying waves in Hollywood and, and, um, and staying on top as a star. And my character is always kind of a, you know, maybe in the B level, she's, she's in all of these films, but none of them are great big hits. You know, she's, uh, she's kind of a filler staple. And, um, and she's clinging, you know, like, like we, like we see these little kittens sometimes cling to things. And she clings on to her fading career with all of her nails because, uh, you know, she's perhaps past her expiry date, you know, on her box of starlet. Um, so, yeah, so I did, you know, a lot of research on the time and the way that women were regarded, but just to inhabit her, you know, I, I, tried to pattern her, her speech and her behavior off of the Lana Turner characters. But, you know, part of it was just me deciding who she was and, and what she felt like on the inside and, and, you know, her hopes and dreams and her, her fragility, I guess. Yeah, and you know, given that she is part of the representation of, of women who weren't treated right by the system and, and weren't given the opportunities that were due to them, given their talent, what was some of that specific research that you found really useful in looking at the way that the studio system existed, the way that they treated women that you pulled in through that portrayal? Um, one of the horrible things that I discovered was that there were these, in the Lana Turner books, uh, she described that there were all of these studio girls, these girls who were on 18 month contracts with all the major studios that were essentially passed along from executive to executive and they were never really intended to become breakouts. They were there as kind of in house, you know, the fresh girls and they would be dated, used up, and then their contracts would be dropped and, and you know, on to the next. And so it was really a very cruel and unfair system and, you know, in this story, when we get to the episode where we discover that she's having an affair with the studio head, Ace Amber, and that she has been for 10 years, um, you know, we see her as a creature of her time, you know, and, and that was the one thing when I got to that scene, when I read it, I was like, oh boy, I had no idea because I had no idea that she had been having an affair with, with him and when I saw the scene, I was like, oh no, are people going to conflate this character with me? Because clearly my, you know, whole role in the Me Too movement and uh, the fact that I steadfastly rejected Harvey Weinstein's advances and then was punished for it by being blacklisted, I refused to sleep with the studio head. She willingly is in a consensual relationship with the studio head, although hers, I do believe, contained affection. I don't believe the studio had was predatory in a frightening way, although I would say that Rob Reiner's character is exercising his droit du seigneur. You know, he's basically, he's the king and he gets to have any of the court ladies at his, you know, at his behest. And he can then sign off on them being greenlit in certain parts, you know. And they reference that he's sleeping with Jean Tierney in this story, and they reference this and that. And he's always got another girl. So I think for her, he's the only man in her life. I think for him, she's just one of his stable, although maybe she holds a special place for him because they do have an affectionate relationship, as you see in the scene. I was kind of terrified of the scene. And when we got to the scene and we actually shot it, Rob was also, I think, quite nervous about it. And that sort of took the, um, the curse off of it and they had an intimacy coordinator and I've never worked with an intimacy coordinator my entire career. 
I have done countless, sad to say, sex scenes. I can't even count how many I've done. And there was never somebody choreographing them or making us feel comfortable. And to Ryan Murphy and Janet Mock's credit, having this gentleman on set was really helpful. It really took away all the fear that, you know, this was gonna be awkward and, and violating in any sense. It was totally above board. And he even offered us padding you know, we could put pads. So actually, even as we're fully clothed, but we're sort of pressed against each other, nothing is actually pressed against anything. And, uh, and it was very, um, it was very, uh, it put us at ease, but then we also were able to sort of jump into sort of a comedic aspect to the scene, which I didn't really foresee as much. And then the scene became very funny. And the scene originally had gone on a lot longer than it goes on now. Um, and I'm sort of sad about that because there were a couple of moments that were so funny uh, in the part that was cut out um, involving him climaxing, yelling the words, Helen Keller, Helen Keller. <laughs> so maybe at some point there'll be like an outtakes kind of, you know, DVD release that'll include the extended scene, which it was like ridiculous. We ended up having so much fun. It was as though it was like a Monty Python sex scene. Um, so, so ultimately this thing when I was like, oh no, is it going to be lurid? Are people going to say that's Nero with Harvey when absolutely it's the opposite? Um, uh, none of that came to pass and I felt really good about it at the end. But it, it, you know, the character is someone who then still feels kind of bad about herself because she has been having this extramarital affair with a married man, although he correctly tells her that Avis, his wife, is having numerous affairs with all of these gas station ex escort guys that we meet in the form of, you know, uh, David Cornsweet's character and, and all the others. And she's literally been having an affair with David Cornsweet's character, um, uh, Jack Costello. Um, so it's kind of like, it's, it's sort of a little bit less nasty than it could be, but I still feel terrible about it. And I go and, and, I go and apologize to Ava Sandberg, played by the incredible Patty Lupone, and, and she amazingly forgives me. And, uh, there's so much humanity in this story. And, you know, a lot of it, I think a lot of it is just really relatable. You know, you, you find people stuck in circumstances they never meant to be in. They finally extricate themselves from them and they have normal feelings that we would feel in this time as, as in any time. But the beauty of it is when they're shown the surprise of beneficence or people sticking their necks out for them or people acting on the good of their heart rather than the, the same old party line and the Hayes Code, what you can and cannot show on screen, who you can and cannot elevate to certain positions, if they're too old, if they're too dark, if they have a funny accent, like, no, it's just this narrow section of society that's gonna be represented and, and vaunted. And this, this story says, you know, what if that was never the case and what if it wasn't the case now? And that's what I love about it. I, 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 I realize I ramble and ramble, sorry. No, no, no. Everything you're saying is so, so interesting in terms of all the different dynamics of how that came together. It's great. Um, one of the other projects I wanted to ask you a little bit about, um, the Quibi show that you've been part of, The Expecting, which is helmed by Mary Heron. And I just wanted to ask you a little bit about the specifics of that because it's, you know, it's a new, it's a new digital form of storytelling where everything's kind of around eight minute bites. And so I was interested in if that causes you to think any differently about the rhythm and the pacing and how much kind of momentum needs to happen in a very short space of time in terms of your craft as, as a performer within that? Yeah, um, well, you know, the thing is, it's sort of shot like a film. You shoot it and it takes about the same amount of time as it would take to shoot an independent film. And I think the total amount of footage is about the length of a film. So when we shot it, I really thought of it more as a film, yeah. um, just because that's sort of my reference, but I do realize that all of these are being cut into these chunks that are these episodes, but I'm not sure that we were fully aware of where the breaks were going to be. Um, and I feel like some of that is a function of the edit ultimately, like where they decide the episode begins and ends because it is an overall tale that carries out. I mean, I think that this was a story in which there was not much improvisation because I think that it, the script had been carefully crafted to make to make those short 
intense bursts. Yeah, I also, in, in follow up to the, what you were talking about in your love of improvisation, and I think you've talked a little bit of, in the past about how you view it as a really useful technique sometimes to exist in your character and take them out into the world. And that that moment that you feel like you can really improv as the character is the moment that you feel like you've really grasped them. And it's, I was curious if that's something that you do more specifically for comedy, if, if you also translate that into drama that you work on and kind of, if that's been something that's been part of your process throughout your career on, on most of the projects that you do. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it was a lot easier when I was unknown. So like when I prepared for Mighty Aphrodite and I went to Philadelphia in character for a weekend and rode the train and talked to these college students and went into camera stores and food stores and negotiated for items, you know, in character. It was a lot easier when nobody would be like, are you Mira Sorvino? Like, what are you doing? That's not your real voice. <laughs> And not that I'm really that recognizable. I mean, a lot of times people will sort of stare at me for like 25 minutes before they'll say, you look a lot like, are you, you know? Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I do it on my own. Like I will just talk to myself in character and walk around the house or, um, you know, early my preparation from my father. He would always have me ad lib lines. Oh, you frozen there. Are you, are you still there? Okay, no. Uh, my internet connection is unstable, it says. Uh, can you hear me? I can, yeah, I can hear you and you're moving. Sometimes it, it pops up and it's true and sometimes it pops up and everything's fine. Okay, all right, yeah. You said your internet connection is unstable. Um, just keep going and hopefully the best. Um, yeah, my father used to have me, whenever I was learning lines, uh, right in the sidelines of the lines, completely ad lib the meaning of the text. So that, and then I would do the scene using completely other words, but trying to get the same underlying beats across and then go right back into the dialogue so as to freshen it up and not get, not get caught in that, in that sort of preset delivery of lines, you know, to be very liney and written. Um, and uh, that's something I've retained my entire life. Um, I always try and, and ad lib and then I'll go back. And then sometimes if I have a director who wants me to be that way, wants me to sort of throw in whatever pops into my head, then those things will kind of bleed into the on-camera performance. And um, Spike Lee was one of those people because he would set up two cameras at once to shoot important scenes, or he'd have one study cam covering just the entire scene as a back and forth master. And when you do that, <laughs> there is that thing again, uh, you were capable of, um, anything went like you could have a completely standalone take that was different from others because you weren't cutting it to match previous versions with the back and forth so you didn't have to have um continuity so when you do that it's very fresh it's very like you know on a high wire without a net and it kind of heightens it a little bit um but you know that's appropriate for certain formats and others are much more you know like if you're doing shakespeare clearly you're not going to do that um uh you know, I think, I think it's a valuable tool to have in your toolbox. Um, and then I, I think, uh, you know, I, I've been talking recently about my dear, recently departed um, acting teacher, Wynn Hanman, who just passed away due to COVID-19. He was 97 and it just really kills me. It just kills me that he survived everything and was so healthy and at 97 his life was ended by this stupid, stupid pandemic. So, um, very sad about that. And I know I'm joined by so many of his alumni. Like he inspired generations of actors and directors and writers. And, you know, his class was this real workshop for people to hone and create material. Like John Leguizamo created several of his plays, workshopping them in our class. Um, I and Laura Kirk uh, uh, and Nat DeWolf uh, started a, we, we started working on a project together there that turned into a feature film that I produced called Lisa Picard is Famous that they started, they wrote. Um, so many different relationships were forged there. I booked a lot of auditions based on work that I worked on in class there, uh, including Barcelona, including a soap opera. Um, and I think that my ability to get Mighty Aphrodite came from uh, me learning to step outside my comfort zone in terms of characters that I would tackle by being in that class. Because when I went into the class, I was still always playing sort of straightforward, serious characters, kind of closer to my own day-to-day -day personality. I had just graduated from Harvard. I was this very studious kind of 
I had a tension person. I was not zany. I was not outspoken. I was rather introverted, actually. And uh, I think over the years, I've slightly morphed. My, my personality is a little bit more comfortable now than it was then. I was more nervous then. Um, but he allowed me to try on different hats, and I started playing uh, the uh, role in um, Born Yesterday. And getting to play that role was the first time I tried on the sort of dumb blonde hat, you know, which is a staple of, of, of cinema and drama history in our cultures. And uh, he had a um, he had a technique called the, the character interview. And midway through your work on a piece of, of material, like if you're working on a scene study or a character, he'd have you come into the class and you'd have 15 minutes. You'd walk onto his stage, which, you know, the, the room was set up like a little black box theater. So you had risers that other students would sit in these risers and you would be on the stage and you walk in, the lights would hit you and he'd say, hello. And he'd, you know, ask you your character's name and you would respond. And then he would talk to you in a conversation for 15, 20 minutes in character. So you had to have so fully inhabited that character and done all this work coming up with their background, what they felt strongly about, what really pushed their buttons. And he would always say, always find the pinch that creates the ouch. Always make the strongest decisions in your character building that really creates strong reactions that when you hit these points in the story and the scenes or when someone says something, they really do something to your insides. You know, he was very much about kind of activating your insides. And um, that really set me on my way to really be able to create these characters that I could be off the page, you know, that I could walk around Philadelphia and be in. And although now I don't really go out in public and try them out, I'll still walk around my house and my rooms and just start talking as the character or writing as the character. Um, and I do find that to be a super helpful tool. And, you know, I'll, uh, I'll do that journal work also for the serious characters. I think the comedic ones, it, it also depends on if they have, if there's a lot of voice work, if there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, dialect work, then I do it out loud a lot, even for the serious characters. I tend to do it out loud all the time for the comedic ones because they're, Comedy requires a certain boldness that if you don't get in the practice of it, you might be too too timid to really do it on the day. Um, so yeah, so I tend to go into that full improvisation, out loud, ad-libbing mode all the time with the comedy and some of the time, especially if it involves a person who speaks in a different way than I do. Yeah, on, on a slightly different trajectory, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your activism work because it's one of the things that I've always been incredibly impressed with by your career and the way that you've always used your voice beyond the projects that you're working on. Um, and I, you know, you've been working as a UN Goodwill Ambassador and, and speaking out against human trafficking for over a decade at this point. And I was interested in the way that that really helped you to harness your voice in, in speaking up for yourself and becoming such a prominent voice in within Time's Up and within the Me Too movement. Because I know at the beginning you weren't very comfortable kind of going out there and talking about your personal experience understandably but you've really kind of again harnessed that voice on behalf of other people particularly with the recent work that you did to help change legislation which has extended the statute of limitations for how long people have to file a suit when they're the victim of sexual harassment or sexual assault yes um well uh yeah it's been a you know it's been a a, a long um very very fulfilling road to be an activist um I have been an activist for many years. I started in their Stop Violence Against Women campaign spokesperson for several years. It was under the banner of that campaign that I discovered human trafficking, that modern slavery was alive and well, that chattel slavery was gone, the legal form of slavery, but you know, it had just transformed into, into this illegal slavery that was underground and all around us and touches every country and every industry. And uh, I started meeting human trafficking victims and they really galvanized my commitment to try and fight this worldwide scourge that really doesn't get better right now. It's really not getting better. It's a $250 billion a year criminal enterprise. It's, uh, it, it always ties for second with illegal arms trades, you know, bested only by the illegal drug trade. And it's kind of crazy because all governments spend so much more money fighting drugs than they do saving people or rooting out the people who are buying and selling people. Um, like we spend more the United States on 
fighting the, you know, the war on drugs in a few hours than we do in an entire year of inter all of our international domestic anti-slavery programs combined. And yet there are 30 million plus people living as slaves today and around 70% of them women and girls. So crazy, crazy, crazy. And the stories of these people, when you meet them, when you meet survivors, and I've now interviewed almost a hundred of them, um, are so heartbreaking and harrowing. You can't believe that people do this to other people. And you also are stunned by the resilience and incredibleness of their human spirit, like that these people have endured the absolute worst and now are flowering and strong and brave and still can be happy and still can have these completely fulfilling lives being what they were intended to be rather than being someone's object. Um, and so that I've been able to throw myself into very passionately and I started working with the UN in 2009 and I continue to work with to this day for U UNODC, which is the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime on human trafficking, but also on other women's issues. Um, and I think that that history of activism, you know, I, I've given countless speeches around the world and I've done fundraising and I've worked on legislation for human trafficking. And that's why when all the Me Too stuff started and I was a part of it, I felt like, well, I need to do something with it that will create action and that will make me feel better about, you know, if I'm, if I am in this sort of victim survivor pool, if I can use my experience to affect change to help prevent someone else from being in that pool in the future or to change the way the culture views all of these things, then I'm turning my trauma into some kind of triumph. And I have found this incredible community of, of like-minded women and men who have also joined, you know, and spoken up and said, yes, me too, it's happened to me too, and, and, and found a kind of a, a strength that, you know, morphs from brokenness into solidarity and to, you know, into wholeness. Um, but it was very hard. I mean, I, I have to say, just being in the public eye and talking about not only what Harvey Weinstein had done to me and then had subsequently done to my career, but other traumas that I had, other sexual violence that had occurred in my past. Um, it put me into a real tailspin. And I think that like, I think it's hard for people to understand who haven't been in the public eye talking about such intensely private, you know, heartbreaking things, really uh, traumatizing life events. Um, but my way towards kind of getting out to the other side has been being involved in in all of these legislative pushes and all of these actions by Time's Up and by Voices in Action, by all these other groups. And I partnered with this group in California called Equal Rights Advocates. And together, along with them and New York, which we did with Time's Up, I've helped pass 10 new laws, have, 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 have helped get 10 laws passed and then enacted into law that pertain to Me Too topics, whether it's sexual harassment or sexual violence and statute of limitations, um, not, banning no rehire clauses, uh, preventing, uh, preventing uh, companies from being able to sneak, uh, sneak people signing away all of their rights without realizing it in, in new documentations they sign when they get a raise or a promotion. Um, uh, many different things, uh, things enforcing this concept of universal education on sexual harassment education with companies working in the state of California. The threshold used to be 50 employees that you had to give this, now it's only five. Um, so, and, and working with Time's Up and the work that they're doing also, they, you know, they created a, a toolkit for the industry along with SAG-AFTRA. Um, so we're doing a lot to change stuff. I mean, is the problem going away overnight? No, but, uh, I honestly believe that each one of us in our own way had a ripple effect of Harvey Weinstein getting convicted. And that is a historic conviction. Um, he is the first white man of power who skated for decades being a sexual predator and incredibly abusing his power and being a kind of an open secret um, who actually has faced the music and gone to prison for his crimes as a convicted rapist. And that really is a sea change. Um, and 
that that trend needs to continue. You know, the super predators out there who are hiding in plain sight. I mean, there have been exposés written on a number of people, and yet he's he's the one who took the first the first credible hit through the justice system, and that's amazing. And I, you know, the, the crazy part is like, I, you know, I've said this before, but like the day the Ronan Farrow article came out and I had been really mightily struggling, you know, in the weeks beforehand, was, was I going to continue to use my name in the story? Because I was very afraid that Harvey would retaliate against me and my family. I was afraid that he had mafia-like connections and would try and hurt my children. And, uh, and I finally decided, no, I, I had to, I had to use my name on the other side of that coin is that I wanted my daughter to grow up believing that you know that this was a world in which you had to be brave and you had to fight for yourself and for the future generations and i wanted her to be proud of her mom um but uh like an hour after the article came out and like everybody in the world was like oh my god what's happening um i got a phone call from annabella shora who said mira we've known each other for 20 years harvey raped me and she had never told me that and it was because of the Ronan Farrow article that she called me and then we talked for hours and we continued to talk for many weeks and she ultimately went public with her story and I think that she was one of the most pivotal witnesses in that trial. And so each of us had this strange ripple effect that empowered everyone else. Like each victim who came out and became this public survivor empowered everyone else. And so, I'm glad that I did it. Do I wish it had never happened to me? Yes. But if my suffering means that future generations will experience less of the suffering and society will become more meritocratic and egalitarian and protective and, um, you know, humane, then, then I don't regret all of it. I don't know if that's answered your question at all. No, it <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I know that my, Self and a myriad of women who are incredibly proud that you did that and appreciative and and I wanted to ask you a little bit about you know that community that you you touched upon I actually I, I worked on the Times Up conference that happened I think two years ago to this week in New York and and I just remember that the energy in that room was unlike anything I've ever witnessed or felt before and just the support and it you know the way that it was women from multiple industries it was people talking about hotel workers and farm workers and you know all sorts of different backgrounds and just like I was curious about for you the 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 power and the positivity that's come out of those connections that have been built and the kinship that now exists across multiple industries that used to exist in silos separate to each other yeah no it's been incredible like uh, the yeah I, I may have been at, was I at that one was that the Tribeca one yeah 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 and that's where I first met Monica Ramirez um, the, you know, from the Farm Workers Alliance and uh, so many other incredible women. And there has been this tremendous sister and brotherhood that is created because, you know, as we know, anyone can be a victim of sexual violence or assault or harassment, not just women and not just men and not gender normative, cis normative, whatever, you know, anyone can be hurt and everyone can tap into this incredible community of people who just have each other's backs. And, um, you know, I, I, I sometimes when I'm just out in public, someone will randomly come up to me who is not in the industry as far as I know, and they'll just say, really appreciate what you're doing. And there's like a touch or a hug or something, and I know that they have been affected by it, you know. And someone told me the other day that, you know, it's really affected I was doing a, a radio tour and this male journalist was like, you know, it's really affected the way people are talking about men coming forward with sexual assault. So know that, know that it's becoming easier for men to actually broach these topics and people not judging it or being weird about it. And, um, you know, this is for everyone. I mean, this has never been just for the entertainment industry. Like none of us did this, you know, certainly I didn't like, uh, it just, I have so many friends who have been raped, so many people in my life who've been abused. Um, and there was never any space for anyone to deal with it or talk about it or bring it forward. Like it was just a deep, dark secret that they tried to get over and tried to shellac over with scar tissue on scar tissue. And um, this is like a worldwide healing that we're trying to accomplish 
across every industry, across every walk of life, across every community. And I have been blessed with the love of people who have just been so generous and kind. And um, I think admitting your vulnerability is no longer the weakness that we thought it would be. And it, it, it is sort of wounding to admit it because you actually have to stop denying it to yourself, right? So if you've spent two decades kind of covering up, you know, not, not thinking about when you were raped or when you were assaulted or when you were harassed or, you know, you're functioning fine. <laughs> you know, you're, you're in denial. Denial is this great panacea for a while, you know, but it's down there. And when you rip off that scar and you say, actually, this happened to me, um, you bring that trauma back up to light and then you then you have to deal with it and then you have to get therapy and you have to actually face it. So it does weaken you on your own personal level in that you're kind of undergoing that confrontation with the reality of it that maybe you've postponed for a really long time. Um, but you are healed by this love that is, is sent to you by every single member of this community, you know, near or far who, who has the same experience and who's like, yeah, we're not, we're not less than because this was done to us. We are not what was done to us. We are what we make of ourselves and, and you know, who we choose to be in this world. And that also includes allowing space for, for, you know, our hurt and, and, and our wounds, but, but we're stronger together. And so, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of, I'm, I'm getting all lost in my feelings here, but it's, it's kind of an amazing time. Out, so. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just so glad that there's been a positive side to all of this as well. And, and thank you so much for being so open and, and talking about all of this and, and as well as your acting work. And I hope that everyone uses quarantine to binge watch Hollywood now that it's on Netflix. Yeah. I think, you know, you know, the thing is, you know, I think it's, it's funny because, you know, I, I, I read some reviews where people are kind of, having an issue with the fact that it has some happy ending element. It's like society's become so like cynical and, and, and material that's delivered to us is usually so dark or edgy that uh, I think people are distrusting of something that can actually make you feel good. But honestly, this story is, is a story about Hollywood. Hollywood was the factory that made happy endings. And not all the characters in the story end up with a happy ending, but the happy endings that are, are because the people have made choices to go with the better angels of their nature and right wrongs. So there are these beautiful, humane, personally led happy endings and, you know, generosity of spirit endings rather than fate turns out wonderfully, they win the beauty contest and they go off to the castle and marry the prince, you know? <laughs> you know, it's it's a different kind of happy ending. And yes, it's all a Fantasia. None of that did happen then. But there's nothing wrong with, with creating this, this beautiful piece of entertainment, which both gives you the wheat germ and gives you the Twinkie. <laughs> like my father always used to say, oh yes, we're going to try and put some, some wheat germ into the Twinkies, this sort of sub rosa, like uh, get, <laughs> get some, some depth into something that appears to be light and frothy. And I think Ryan's a master of giving you something that is shiny and beautiful and glossy and sexy and titillating, but there's wheat germ in there and then those happy endings are earned. So I think what the world needs right now is the possibility of happy endings, you know, the possibility of, of, of self-led beautiful, meaningful, happy endings that don't rely upon like, like external, like materialistic rentings of good fortune, but actually interhuman, you know, people blessing each other with goodness and kindness and, and a hand up. And uh, I think it's going to make people who are suffering right now in this dark time, because this is a dark time, I think it's going to give them something to be happy about and to feel really good about and just enjoy the whole thing. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And thank you so much again. Really appreciate all of this. Thank you.